Before working in the theatre, Mark Winter had a successful career as a pop singer in the very early 60s, with several hit records to his name. When the Beatles and other groups arrived on the scene in 1963, the popularity of Mark's style of music began to wane. Consequently, in 1967, he started to make the transition from singer to actor. I asked him how that came about. Well, I, I did my first musical in Ireland in 1967 with Milo O'Shea. It was a, I played a second lead, and it was the life story of Percy French, the famous Irish songwriter. People normally go, who? <laughs> but when you start when you listen to his songs, like, Have you heard of Phil the Fluter from the town of Ballymuck? Well, the times were going hard with him. In fact, the man was broke. Dee, 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 dee. He wrote all those yeah. wonderful little Irish songs. Very indigenous. And once I did that musical in '67. I thought, I want to be in a book show. But that was as Mark Winter pop singer. Yes, but I was playing the part of Charles Manners, who was a high baritone, who was an actual character, mm. who was Percy French's close friend at Trinity College in Dublin. So it was a, it was a, it was a genuine, real story. Mm. Uh, I, I had two songs. It was a second lead. Uh, Milo O'Shea was wonderful as Phil, who was a tramp, whom Percy French wrote mm. the song about. Um, and uh, I, after I'd done that show, that book show in '67, I really missed being in a, in a book show because you know, as a solo singer, it's a pretty solitary life. It's very solitary. Unless you get all the credit as well, though. Well, yeah, but it, you, there's more to life than that. I think mm. you know. If you, I had a, my own pianist MD travel with me quite a lot. He was older than me, so come the end of showtime, or in those days in the 60s, there was lots of good cabaret dates around. Sadly, there aren't any more, but there were. There, were a whole, yeah. there was a whole circuit of them, particularly in the north and midlands of, of England. And uh, at the end of the evening, when you'd done your act, your hour, at 10 o'clock, well, my MD pianist, being an older guy, would go off with the other musicians who were provided by the club. And then, I don't know, they'd go to other clubs or they'd sit and have <laughs> quite a few bevies, I think, until the early hours. And I didn't want to do that. I just mm. didn't want to do that. It wasn't, I mean, I'm not... I'm not you know, really a, much in the way of a drinker at all. And, uh, and and I found it pretty solitary. But once I was in a book show, I so enjoyed working with other people, which I had done, actually, working in big... Pa I'd done some very big pantomimes that were wonderful. Um, you know, huge sets, costumes, and, you know, when you had four weeks' rehearsal for a pantomime in those days. Now it's about seven days, isn't it? Um, and I really loved it. And I, th and I felt much more at home in a book show than I did anymore being a solo artist. And how conscious a decision was it to do this? When you were at the peak of your teen idol phase, when you were 1920, did you have a game plan at that point? No, none at all. You started quite young, 16 or 17. 17. And My first record when I was 17. And you picked it, what, 1920-ish, something like that? About I mean, 21, I 22. No, 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 no. I was about 21, 22, um, yeah, when the and you, and, pop thing. And I had about four or five, about five years mm. of good, good. And what did, when you were at your peak then, what did you think you were going to be, going to be doing at 40? Well, at that stage, you know, Michael, I mean, things were still pretty good in the variety. I mean, mm. who would have thought that... I mean, I have some compilations out and four yeah. CDs out. And I think it's on, more now than there. There were even 10, 15 years Yeah, ago. there are, because I think people are reminded of a kind of times and times mm. that were more fun. I think, um, you know, of course, in those days, you, you would have about six or seven people on the bill who all had hit records. And the ones that um, <clears throat> could actually perform on stage... And there's a huge demand still. I know, as yeah. I say, I have been asked to go out on tour, on, on pop tours. But the other thing that, for me, doesn't really work is that of those one-nighters, you'd be lucky if you did 70 one-nighters a year, 70 one-nighters. Well, what do you do the rest of the year? Doing a play on a weekly tour, as I've said to you earlier, is, is, it's relentless and it has its, you know, it has its tough side as well as its good side. I don't think I'd want to do one night as and find a different place to stay every night. Singing the same song and... I know, that was another thing. I, I really relished being challenged mm. when I did my first musical and then a musical in London in 69 um, and then uh, the first play, Conduct Number Coming, in 70. I went to Australia with that for six months and then I came back and found I was a, like a jobbing actor because I decided to stick with that. And I did lots of other wonderful stuff in rep apart from Sleuth, you know, I did Macbeth... Uh, you, didn't do, you didn't go to drama school or anything like no, that. No, not at all. But I, I, but I was lucky that I was offered. I was offered these parts because it was a bit of trick casting, really, to have but somebody did, who's in the pop world come and play a Shakespeare. Did, didn't you find that acted against you to a certain extent? It did, that you weren't taken seriously. No, I was actually because I was very lucky that I had good notices, um, and I got more and more inquiries to go and play in rep, which I wanted to do because I wanted an across-the-board experience 
of all kinds of plays. Um, and I was also still being seen for uh, musicals and things. So I was, I was very lucky that I had an across-the-board consideration. And as summer seasons and pantomime started to fade out, you know, variety started to die off, um, <clears throat> which is a great tragedy, I think, terrible tragedy. Um, I, I found that I fitted in well with uh, being able to divide my time between musicals in London. I was in Cats, played Phantom, you know. Um, and and Charlie Girl and, and other things and I was very lucky. Um, what I sorry, oh, Sweet Charity in London and uh, I, I was just fortunate that I, that they came they came away. I was accepted in a different guise when I was in my very first play in London in 1970, which was Conduct Unbecoming at the Queen's Theatre in Shaftesbury Avenue. Cliff sent me a first night telegram, saying how much he envied me in doing what I was doing because he wanted to make that transition too into acting. As you know, made a couple of quite good early films, Cliff. You know, as as Presley did, and you know, but then it went the sort of you know in those rather corny musical things. Um, and I saw Cliff in a play actually. He, he wasn't that good. Well, I, I thought Presley think. could have had a good future, frankly. I really did. Cliff didn't stand a chance. No, I mean, I'll tell you why. Because I saw him in Five Finger Exercise. You know, the Peter Schaffer yeah, yeah. play at the old Bromley Theatre before it was burned down. There's a new one there now, and. He didn't have a chance because every time he came on stage, the audience was full of mums and young girls who oohed and aahed throughout the whole play. But he, he was in a re couple of reasonably good films. Espresso Bonga was a reasonable Very film. good. And he was Very OK good. in that because he was well cast. He was yeah. cast to type. Very good. Musicals that were a, were a backdoor entry into straight theatre, but they were certainly a, a transition point for for somebody who was primarily a singer mm. to go from musicals then into absolutely into straight theatre. Yeah, but I, I mean, it doesn't happen to everybody. You know? yeah. I mean, and I, but I made a concerted... And, and firm decision not to go back into the pop world at that stage because I wanted casting people to think of me seriously as an actor. Um, all right, I was still in musicals, but I wanted to be considered as an actor as well. So I, I suppose I put myself through the same um, and harness as a jobbing actor would in, in terms of auditioning, learning speeches, and, and all that, that that entails. Did it open or close doors for you, the teen idol thing? Oh, the Teen Idol opened doors. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. And as I say, I think that um, because I'd done a lot of work singing on the BBC with the BBC big band and orchestras and stuff like that, so I was able to have good consideration for music. Did you make any money as a pop singer? Yes, but nothing like what they make today. I mean, I, was I mean, lucky. money to keep? Not really, no. What, what, what was paid then was, well, I think... A my, good way. My, fir think, my first uh, summer season at Bournemouth on the pier... I got fifteen pounds a week, which I suppose in nineteen sixty was good. Yeah. But then I, but then I, I paid my agent, my manager. I sent some money home to my mother. I paid my digs that were ten and six a night, Those bacon and days. beans every morning. <laughs> Happy days. And being woken up by the guy next door who got up to empty his um, potty under the bed in the middle of the night, <laughs> coughing his heart up. Um, but yeah, so uh, good times. I was very, I was, I loved it. It was great. It was what wonderful. What was the most you earned as a, as, as a pop singer? Do you think three fifty a week was tops? And when would that be? Mid sixties. Yeah, that was good then. Yeah, it? very good, very good. Yeah, but I, but it, you know, as a solo singer, you have a lot of expenses. Yeah. Because I pay for my own. I didn't have a band. I didn't have a group or a band, so I paid for my own musical arrangements. And quite often, I was working with big bands or big orchestras. And that, that was quite expensive even then. You'd make you know. all your own arrangements and everything. To yeah, I mean, nowadays, they're, they're yeah, formidable. Yeah. Nowadays, a big band arrangement would cost you an arrangement of £500. But um, they were expensive even in those days. So, you know, and I had a publicist, so, you know, I had quite a lot of outgoings. Mm. Yeah, I did have quite a lot of outgoings. But um, to tell you the truth, I never, ever thought about money. I wasn't... Uh, I wasn't a spendthrift. I wasn't somebody who wanted to live hard. It was a short-lived period for, for Britain's beat ballad singers. I think it, it was... Once the groups came along in, the, in 1963, yeah, I think the death knell was Did you feel that? A bit. Yes, I did, yeah, because it was groups all over the place. Mm. I was still... But I was lucky. By then, I'd sort of moved into summer seasons and pantomimes. Mm. So I, my year was mapped out, I, more or less. I knew that I was going to be doing a 16-week summer season, uh, a big pantomime summer, which then would run for... Well, gosh, I did one at the Palladium that ran from um, the, the second week of December until the third week of March. Uh, but yeah, I think it was it was a short-lived period for beat ballad singers, and I could see that the end was coming. And so when I moved into the theatre, and the first time when I was doing pantomime, for instance, and summer shows, I liked it. I thought, you know, the lighting was right. Uh, there were people that were experts in their field. You got a really good band behind you, and it was a it was a whole different level from being on tour and being backed by two guitars, bass, and drums.
But I, I, I'm, I'm exceedingly happy with what I'm doing because, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm constantly challenged with new things, and that's what I like. It's, I like to be learning new but things. But if the phone went tomorrow and said, can you do a season four of Singing at Las Vegas, you'd say... Yes. I was offered a season at Las Vegas. <laughs> I was speaking metaphorically, but you know what I mean. Yeah. That wouldn't happen now because Las Vegas has changed. I was, yeah, there, I was there two years ago. Uh, no, I don't know if I would change my did way you, of life now because I've got three children sure. and everything, and, and you know, I was a late father. Um, and my, my, my children are, are still in education, all three of them. What do they them. think of um, Mark Winter? Oh, well, I'm just just dead, aren't I? I mean, nothing. They don't think of it at all. Do they see it? Have you, have you shown them stuff? They play the records? No, never. Not interested. <laughs> Not interested at all. <laughs> They'd rather play, you know, these funny groups like Elbow or, you know, whatever these names of groups are that they listen to. Do you miss those days at all? Oh, yeah, they were very exciting. I mean, there's a terrific, um, there's a greater harnessing in being an actor and a, a lot more discipline. I mean, you have to look after yourself as a singer, of course, you can look after your voice and so on. But as an actor, um, the, the harnessing is, is quite severe. I mean, it's, the discipline is, is enormous, both mentally and in every other way. And if you're not a disciplined person as an actor, then I don't think you'd cut it, especially on tour. Especially on a run where you really have to control it, because I imagine it's fairly easy to let it slip and oh, yeah. become a bit blasé oh, yeah. about it. And, uh, and there's, there's, no, there's not a lot of margin for error, really, because it, it, it is a team thing, and, and you can't just think of yourselves. And